So this is uh, Jim Schwab, manager of the Hazards Planning Research Center for the American Planning Association. We're going to be talking to Bill Symbieta today. He is a professor from the University, uh, California Polytechnic State University, but uh, in Japan. And uh, this interview is on our Recovery News blog, which is part of our current project planning for post-disaster recovery, next generation, uh, underwritten by FEMA, part of a three-year project that uh, we're about halfway into. So uh, okay. welcome, Bill. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'd like to have you tell us a bit about what you are actually doing in Japan. I know that you're uh, currently stationed there for a year. You're in uh, what city? I'm in the city of Kyoto. Kyoto, the University and, of Kyoto? Yeah, no, I met, well, I met... Um, yeah, Kyoto University. I'm um, a research professor in what they call the Research Center for Disaster um, um, Reduction Systems, which is one of the ten centers inside the Institute for Disaster um, Research and Prevention Institute. So there's this large institute at Kyoto University. It's the largest in the country. They have different ten centers. Uh, most of them are are hard science and engineering, um, volcanoes, seismic floods, um, landslides. Uh, very technical centers, and and my center is is much more on social solace, social science planning and policy. Even though they have a new policy center, so um, that's where I I'm I'm with a very talented, experienced team of um, people do different parts of disaster research um, with a heavy emphasis on Asia and like um, and Southeast Asia, um, Indonesia, um, China, um, Vietnam. So that's more their territory uh, than, than not. And uh, they do everything from um, studies of evacuation behavior right down to how to, you know, study soil uh, compositions uh, for landslide, um, you know, shoring up landslide areas. Wow. So uh, can you tell us a bit more about the specific research that you're doing, uh, what research brought you to uh, Japan, and what you've had a chance to look at and examine since you arrived there? Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm doing work in, in uh, two areas. One in what I call recovery theory, which is the theory of how you actually recover from a big um, disaster, which we call an extreme event, uh, um, an extreme event that disrupts most of the uh, local systems in the area, and systems of infrastructure, education, commerce, and uh, people. So that's one area of work. And in, uh, because I came here before the Tohoku uh, earthquake and tsunami. Um, uh, I wasn't going to work on that, but since I'm here and that's such a, a, an enormous event, I'm also working to understand the recovery process in the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, which is the biggest event of its kind in Japanese history. Um, and um, the uh, Japan has had an, a number of giant earthquakes. Uh, in the last century, um, they've had over eight that's killed more than a thousand people each um, since 1912. So, so they they have a good sense of uh, what to do with earthquakes. But this event in Tohoku, um, which is really a region of of the name is represents a region of of Japan, uh, the east and north northeastern section of the country. Um, is um, we would call it a multi-state event. Three prefectures are primarily hit, but there are seven prefectures um, involved. And it's the first event in the world that includes a nuclear um, a nuclear disaster uh, with the shutdown of three reactors in the the uh, Fukushima uh, prefecture plant uh, um, reactor park of Temco. So. Uh, for the world, this is an important um, event because it involves nuclear um, 
uh, problems, actually, release of nuclear uh, radioactive material in one province, not in all of them, just in one province. So I've been trying to understand the Japanese system of recovery um, based on uh, what I now call uh, multi-locational disasters, of which there's been a few in the in the world in the last three years. Uh, one uh, occurring in um, in Chile in 2010, and then there's the, the the great tsunami that occurred in Indonesia, India, and the, in China you had a multi-locational event in 2008 in Wenchuan, and now this one in Japan. So there's a class of disasters which I'm now calling multi-locational, which we could have in California easily um, in the Sacramento Delta area. Uh, you could have the entire Sacramento Delta into the uh, Central Valley go down um, with, for a number of different reasons, seismic flooding. And uh, we know very little about multi-locational events um, generally. Um, but So I'm studying how the Japanese recover. And this event is important because it's over 600 kilometers in length. Uh, it starts out in the south in the... In <coughs> uh, in Fukushima then goes to Miyagi Prefecture which is next to it and where the city of Sendai has a big flat plain and then goes into the city and the, the problem with the big flat plain is that obviously tsunamis go way into a flat plain right? part of the city is below sea level and then in the north it's very uh, mountainous where there's uh, lots of small fishing villages on bays and they have very little land um, where where the people live before it gets to to the hillsides and mountains, and that's why lots of people died in those communities because it you know evacuation is very hard when you're trying to run uphill. Um, I mean, you run up the mountainside, um, and so there um, you had areas where more than 10% of the population died, which is a big number in any town, and that um, um, up to 50% of the, the town's major area got impacted. So I'm, I'm working on that, um, uh, this multi-locational idea, and then I'm, I'm trying to understand the different planning uh, regimes or planning styles of recovery that are going on both in Chile and in here in Japan, and then I'm going to New Zealand soon, and I'm going to uh, uh, talk to people in New Zealand about the same thing about how the what's the relation between the local government, the the state government, and the national government, and how they they deal with that. Um, and then I'm just I'm learning a lot about the Japanese system in 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 doing this, and I do field work in in Tohoku and go and watch the cities and then talk to local officials and, uh, about their recovery plans and what's happening. A lot of temporary housing. The Japanese built 70,000 temporary housing units in three months. Uh, I mean, it's so impressive um, um, compared to any place else in the world how much they could do in so short a time. So part of being in Japan is being, being impressed by their uh, focus on, uh, on how to deal with emergencies and disasters. Great. Well, I have to tell you that first, I, I would love to talk to you after you get back from New Zealand. <laughs> okay. Spent some time there three and a half years ago yeah. uh, on a, as a visiting fellow for uh, the Center for Advanced Engineering in New Zealand, in, which is based <laughs> in Christchurch, where the earthquake happened. But uh, going back to this uh event that you were just talking about. It's not only, you know, multi-locational, um, it's also multi-dimensional. Uh, yes. It's one of those cascading events where you start with the uh, the earthquake that triggers the tsunami that then triggers the nuclear crisis, and a whole series of, of consequences flow out of all of that. Uh, what would you, from what you've seen, describe as some of the more unique dimensions of this particular event? Well, um, <laughs> there, th this whole idea of cascading, um, um, uh, cascading disaster events is, I think, is important for us to understand that um, in a in one 
one town called Kasanuma in, in the Iwate province, um, and that the uh, this is a, a, a fishing community that brings in excellent uh, high grade uh, fish and sells for the highest prices in Japan. Uh, it has a long um, um, mouth into a big bay uh, that goes up into the town. The uh, earthquake hit and then um, uh, damaged some of the, the pier areas, the fishing boat areas uh, of docking. Then the tsunami came in and um, crashed some boats together in the bay, which started a fire on the boats. And the tsunami took those boats that had that were on fire, full of fuel, and took those boats all the way up the bay and dumped them inland into a residential area, uh, which started a giant fire in this residential area, which couldn't put, be put out because it just had to burn out. Uh, so you had then three events. You had the earthquake, the tsunami, and then the fire in this residential area, and that's a cascading set. Um, so that I was very impressed with that. Uh, that how cascading events you know could happen where um, entire neighborhoods could get burned out. You couldn't do anything about it because um, everyone was running away from the fire. Um, the other thing is um, I saw in in some communities um, Rizena Katata. I, I always say that wrong, uh, but a four story hospital that went down uh, four stories where the people who got only on the fifth floor, uh, almost to the roof, survived, and a lot of patients died because the, the, uh, they put the gen extra generators and every, um, the emergency equipment in the basement because big generators and fuel oil are heavy, so you engineer them, put them in the basement where it's easy to get them in and out. Well, the tsunami knocked them out right away, and then the hospital the next wave uh, just destroyed the whole first and second floor and all the patients. They couldn't get them upstairs because the elevators didn't work, and a lot of people died in that hospital. Um, that, that was important to understand um, how the hospitals uh, got injured. Uh, there's uh, another, which I have a very good picture of, another three-story fire station in which the fire, which was three stories high, and they... Uh, they found the fire chief on the roof holding on to a big um, uh, antenna pole, and that's how he was rescued. He was on the roof of a three-story building, which is steel building, which so they wiped out everything. The only steel frame was available. But the firemen were smart, smarter than the hospital people. They had put all their communications equipment on the third floor of a three-story building. So they, you know, because they figured they might get wiped out on the first floor, right? Well, and that's true. Then the second floor, but they never thought they were going to get everything wiped out on the third floor, and everything got wiped out there too. And then he went on the roof and then climbed on this antenna pole, and that's he was finally rescued from the roof. So those are impressive things. Um, uh, I think the variety of temporary housing um, of, of high quality, even though there's some of low quality, I'm not saying that. It's impressive. And they took over um, actually a camping park uh, for a trailer camping park and they uh, they rebuilt in this camper trailing park, which is very in a wooded area, uh, different types of temporary housing. Some of it very nice, um, very well thought about, thought out, and that's good. Um, the other thing that's impressive is that they've put back in some towns like uh, Ofanato, I think I was uh, in um, it's a nice town. Um, um, shops and stores are already back in some of the damaged areas in um, temporary, what you would call uh, prefab mobile uh, modulized um, storefronts, and they just roll them in, put them on the ground, and put them up and make them nice, and people start their businesses again, um, small businesses, and they're doing that in order to get people back to work, you know, and have a feeling of recovery. That, that's impressive. Um, uh, also, um, the national government is, 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 puts in a lot of money in this. Every, every town and community can get um, a set of consultants uh, from a bigger city, uh, mostly from Tokyo or Osaka, um, big firms that send in um, 
planners and engineers, and they, they've, the central government has given these consultants to the towns for a year. Um, their contracts will come out in July. So they have a year of using these consultants as technical assistance to make their recovery plans, which is important to towns that have lost, um, I mean, some towns lost the entire city hall. Right? So where do you go to work, right? Um, you know, you, you have no place to go to work. You find the building and you take it over and you're in some building, some school, and, and you're doing city hall from the school. Um, and, um, and of course, they lost all their records, uh, you know, in, in some of these towns. And um, so there's projects going on to rebuild uh, databases. Um, there's a project in, in my institute that's called the Victims Registry, um, which is a... Um, uh, uh, which was designed to marry all the different kind of data sets together and given to the province and, and they can track the victims and track all the services that they're getting from the provincial level and then they're going to give the system back to the municipalities as municipalities get the capacity to use it. That's a very impressive system. I'm actually trying to get the the guy who put that system together um, to, to do a small uh, piece to send to your blog. Um, right. I, I've been working on that. I, uh, I actually did a little draft last week uh, for him in a in a diagram, and he's looking it over and thinking about it. So I'm, I'm pushing APA blog as much as I can. Th those are some of the 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 important the important things. Um, debris. The other thing which is impressive to everyone uh, besides the 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 sadness of being in areas where you have over 16,000 people died uh, and and um, the injury count uh, being high and, and hundreds of thousands of houses lost is the amount of debris. Um, the debris piles are actually four and five stories high um, and the Japanese have separated all this debris out. Uh, they have piles of metal, piles of Plastic and things, piles of other stuff, and each of these piles get um, get disposed of in a different way. So the metal piles, which are um, giant piles of cars mostly that are that are in crushed up and made into little squares um, blocks, and then they lift them up. The cars will all go to some steel smelter to get metal to get you know melted down and reused, but um, the um, the general garbage gets sent to some incinerator, um, a lot of them around Tokyo, to get burned uh, in that. And then there's another, I don't, I don't know where they all go, but that, that's the most impressive thing, is the amount of debris um, and debris management that this is required. And every all you see in every town are giant uh, dump trucks uh, loaded and um, caterpillars working. I mean... Every piece of equipment of every big contractor, you know, it seems in the country are, are there. And now the other thing, this, this cascading effect, what this has happened is they've brought in all these um, heavy construction work or equipment types. Um, and uh, they're working all the time and on doing this and doing the um, tearing down buildings, making debris piles, separating debris. And this is this has caused an actual uh, shortage of rooms in small town hotels and stuff because they're all filled with temporary workers doing debris management. Um, and um, um, I was in one small town um, where the only rooms left were in a very in a small Japanese hotel that was put together in the downtown area after the event uh, by an enterprising guy. You know, had some some rooms, and it's all tatami. It's basically a room with a um, a mat and a, and a mattress on the floor, right? And you go in there and you sleep there, and then you go to a, there's a common shower area, and then they serve you breakfast, and that's the hotel. Um, and but it's full, right? That was the only place left in the town when I was there uh, before to to go in this one place. Um, so it's brought in, you know, a lot of these kind of jobs. Um, and so anyone who goes there is, is impressed by the amount of debris and that you actually, it looks like the World War II pictures of, of, of in Europe that you see these towns. I mean, entire blocks and blocks and blocks are t 
totally flattened out as the buildings get have been taken down and demolished for debris. So you actually sit there and you see from a uh, hillside 20, 30 blocks near the mouth of the the harbor that are all abandoned. You think they're abandoned. You think it's one of the, the kind of um, outside of Detroit towns that we, we hear about in the U.S. of uh, depopulation. This is simply total destroyed and they're going to have to be rebuilt. That's the other thing that impresses, impresses you is the the, the level of devastation. Um, and at the same time, all these people working to get the debris out because there's a sense of we're going to do something about this. So at the same time, you see devastation and you see um, um, the new future unfolding. And um, you can go to, to town halls. And in the town hall, when you walk inside the town hall, um, you you can see the reconstruction plan sitting on a table and for everyone to read there's a, a electronic copy there's paper copies and so everyone could read the reconstruction plans and comment on them there's lots of meetings lots of um, lots of discussion about what this administration means but it's it's certainly occurring um, in, in Japan the problem of citizen administration is not um, having a citizen participation, but who is involved because it's ten tendency to be more older people and not the younger people, but it's really going to be the younger people who are going to have to populate these communities in the future. The older people you know, go to the meetings, but they're, they're older in their 70s, some in their 80s. Um, and um, so who participates in the, in the, um, in the, from the citizen side is, is become an issue. And then there's, um, a whole idea of rethinking what the schools get used for, because in some small towns uh, with a lot of older people, you don't have a lot of school children. So th there is a question in some towns, do you rebuild the schools? Well, because the, there's not a lot of kids. But if you don't have schools, it's hard to attract young families to come to this town to work, right? So in the repopulation and the, the new economy and getting new jobs. I mean, it's very hard to say, I'm going to build a new factory in your town when you have no schools for the, you know, workers. Um, and so that, that becomes a debate as, as to where do you put the school, what the school is supposed to do for the town in terms of recovery. So it's, it, it's actually very good. It's a good debate to have because it, it, it fundamentally looks at the dynamics of, uh, of planning and development in these communities and the, the age structure, which we don't do in the United States very much. I mean, we sort of take it for granted that we'll be evenly distributed by age. And then when you get too many older people, you say, oh, it's Sun City. It's those older people living outside of Phoenix there. You know, there's something wrong with them. Well, you know, they're all clustering together. Well, the young people cluster together in, you know, the clubs, but the old people can't cluster together. But here, a, the, the population, um, because the, Japan right now um, doesn't have enough um, births, enough young people, right? So it's actually depopulating in terms of total population. This is a giant issue. The major, the biggest issue is this population distribution in Japan. And when you scratch the surface, everyone will tell you that. Um, and um, so those are some of the impressions. Yeah, some of those things really sound reminiscent to the conditions that we saw after Hurricane Katrina, with the possible exception of the level of efficiency you're describing. Yeah, it's very efficient. More efficient <laughs> over there. Uh, which leads to another question I have, which is how you would compare Japanese emergency management and disaster recovery planning from um, how you would compare that with the system here in the U.S.? Well, um, I mean, you're asking a, a loaded question, which I'm <laughs> going to offend a lot of FEMA people or uh, emergency management people at the federal <laughs> level, um, which I don't want to offend them because it's not their particular fault. The Japanese are much more efficient. Um, that's the, the, my opening statement. And the reason for that is um, they have national, certain national laws that, make, that allow them to be efficient. Right. Um, they, they, after the Kobe earthquake, and they've had, because they've had so many earthquakes in the last century and so many other kind of floods and events, they've passed legislation and they've organized themselves to be more efficient. That's the first thing. The central government has most of the money in the country. Um, it's a different, collect, different from our federal system. For right, sure. absolutely. They, they have most of the money and they, they collect all the, 
the sales taxes and stuff, and they give that back to the municipalities. So the municipalities have uh, less money and less capacity, so they have to get it from the center or from the, the national government. Um, also, that after Kobe, they passed some n- new legislation that has created a, a, a special disaster council that that uh, informs the the prime minister, and that council then um, has members of the different ministries. It's part of it, but the council is basically um, outside people, and uh, they can direct the, the council, informs the prime minister. The prime minister generally takes their advice and then informs the ministries to do it. So there's a lot of efficiency. In fact, three hours after the earthquake, the National Council Office had a team, uh, an EOC, assembled and sent to the region. Three hours. Three hours. I mean... If you want a statistic, you want a metric, three hours later, they had a team in place in the region. Um, and uh, I won't go back to the Katrina analysis anymore on that. But So they're much more efficient. Um, national law says that the government will pay uh, 80, <coughs> about 80% of the debris management costs. All right, So that's not even a, an issue. But in this case, um, the government has stepped up, and the central government, national government, I, and I'm told they're going to pay 100% of the debris management costs. Um, and um, so that's that's one clear thing. And the debris management, you know that debris management is a big deal, um, very big deal in any large disaster. So they're, that's why everyone is working there all the time, and they're going to get paid. So that's much more efficient. So they know they're going to take away the debris even at 80% level. Secondly, the um, the national, this national ministry, this national council, um, issues some general kind of guidance on recovery um, that's clearly um, used in the cities. All the cities that... that um, I look at now have um, recovery plans. They made them between four and six months after the event. A recovery plan was published on their website. Um, actually, Miyaki Miyaki Prefecture has a short one in English too. Um, um, not complete, but but it's good. It's okay. Um, and um, so they're efficient in providing the consultants to do that. Um, um, they've issued giant recovery set of recovery bonds um, this past week. That's how they're they're financing this. The recovery bonds are actually bought. uh, The total offering was bought by people in Japan, right, by by citizens right right off the shelf. Um, And they were very successful bond offering. It shows that the nation is behind this recovery, right? Everyone's taking their own money and buying the bonds. Bonds don't pay a lot of interest, but nothing pays very much interest here. So, they, they have the financing in place. It wasn't um, like the U.S. system of going through the Congress and fighting about it and who's going to pay. Do they have this? But they don't. They, they, they have a different system of, um, of housing. Um, the, the people don't get money um, to buy uh, for housing um, recovery um, themselves. I mean, so they're not going to get um, – the government isn't going to you know, build them a house and give them a house. That, that some, somehow not thought about – in that way, there'll, there'll be other systems. There'll be some social housing built, which are be owned by the prefecture. They'll be inexpensive to rent. Those are mostly for elderly people, but they they've have experience with that. They build them, rent them uh, out. People can stay there until they die, and for a very inexpensive rent, so that's a good system. Um, a housing is generally appropriate to the region. It gets very cold there, um, snowed every day. I was there in the mountains and the hills, which is means three miles from the sea. Um, and um, so I think they're much more much more efficient. There's no one in the whole country that I've met that doesn't think that the recovery is going to happen. It's just whether the recovery is what we would call good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, it's so it's the country is set up, the national government is set up to support various parts of recovery. It's how it's, it's done is different. The other thing is that the, the um, certain... Um, prefectures like states, um, they have a much more cooperative system than we have. The states have actually, a uh, prefecture like Kobe and others, have sent staff to one of the affected prefectures to help them out. Basically, they said, took a bunch of their staff and they said, okay, you go up to 
you know, Iwate and you work with the Iwate people for a month or two months um, and, you know, help them out because they need staff. Some staff died and other kind of things. So there's a lot more cooperation between governmental levels here of actually just sending people and say you work and help out and and that's accepted. Um, um, lots of people from a lot of big volunteer groups have, have uh, worked in these areas, um, especially in the emergency um, emergency phase of helping people um, in temporary housing. And um, also the, the um, people from different universities, I've, I've met every university that uh, I've, I've been to here. In fact, uh, there's somebody on the faculty who, who have gone up there and are working there and work there, and the, especially in the recovery committees, <coughs> and just went up there and used their own money until they ran out of money. Right? Um, and that's, all, that's kind of all accepted. Uh, there's something called the Disaster Re um, Reconstruction Institute in Kobe, which is a, a nonprofit, and they send a staff, one staff member of their senior staff goes for a week at a time up to Sendai, and when that person comes back, they send another, and that's been going on for months. So one, one spends a week there, and another one goes, and they all work with the, the, the government uh, people on the recovery issues. So um, I think that's that's a lot of efficiency um, in there. Their, 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 um, what's going to be very sticky is that um, in some of the towns they're they're thinking about declaring certain areas um, as as non-return uh, areas because of the, uh, there's liquefaction and the subsidence of the the land. And in those non-return areas, you're really saying to someone, I'm going to take your, the house is already gone. The house has been destroyed. I mean, there's nothing there. It's just the land. So they're going to have to say, we're going to buy your parcel, right? And then they actually and then have to relocate them or give them another parcel in some higher ground, which the cities then have to go and even if the central government will pay for the infrastructure, but when the higher ground areas, the city will have to maintain that infrastructure over time. It's going to be a municipal issue. So um, that working out of who gets which plot in the relocation system, you know, in the new areas is going to be like anything, a sticky issue. But it, it will happen in some areas that have uh, heavy subsidence because there's, there's an instability in the land and, and uh, no one's going to, pay for that. The other thing is that the, some of these areas have had tsunamis consistently back to the 879, um, right? So this is not an area that they know about. I mean, most of the small towns have big levees, um, what they call dikes, uh, levee and dike areas and then breakwaters. And the question is, do you rebuild them higher or lower? And the do the gates, I mean, there was one place where the, they have gates and a bunch of firemen went to these one these gates to go and close them, and they the tsunami came in so fast that they couldn't close them, and they all the firemen died at the gates. I mean, it's like a drama, right? Trying to close the gates, they all died as the tsunami came in. But the tsunami, you know, reached um, when when people talk about fifteen meters. Um, I mean, this is enormously high, of, you know, event fifteen meter fifteen meter event. Um, and and it brings it takes everything with it. That the, there is nothing more destructive, um, you know, than, than than tsunami in in the sense it's like tornadoes goes through and picks up the you know the, the trailer park in mm -hmm. Oklahoma and drops the trailer park, you know, in Arkansas, right? Um, it's that kind of event. It destroys everything. Um, well, if you think about see, it, a fifteen meter, or, yeah, fifteen meter. I think is what you said. Yeah. Um, wave. You're, you're talking about a wall of water that is five stories high. That's, That's right. That's a frightening thought. It is. It is. It is frightening. Uh, it it just is. And and so, um, the that's why they they have a whole um, system of, of of thinking about. It. They, they study evacuation. They study. They they have micro micro studies of evacuation all over different parts of of Japan that have gone for years. Um, and there's a theory of evacuation um, put forth by a, a man who was 
eighty one he just died um by not from tsunami he died from natural causes but um his theory is is um about just running i mean his theory is that you have to when tsunami comes, you have to turn and run. You don't pick up anything. You don't get your family. You don't get your dog. You run. This is a, a big, a big um, theory that that people tell all their children, and uh, there's some debate about this, but um, it seems to work uh, very well and saves people to spend the rest of their lives and do go on. And um, so there's, there's a lot of research on this whole evacuation, but now. What they're likely to do in some towns, and, and there are some proposals, is that they, they're going to have, because in the small towns where you have to run up the hill, it's, you know, if you're 85 and on a cane, it's hard to run up that hill, Jim. Not even for you, I think, you know. So um, they, they're, they're thinking about rebuilding what they call vertical evacuation. Build buildings tall enough that people can go into a, an evacuation center, it will be a tall building, someplace in the city that's easy to run to. And then you go up in that building to the eighth floor, ninth floor, tenth floor, right? and that's where you evacuate too. So this vertical evacuation idea is up is is in, is in play. It's a discussion that's going on, and how 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 do you make that happen to do vertical evacuation? Which actually, if you will see these towns, is a a reasonable a reasonable idea. Um, how you make it work is different, but um, but so. Um, yes, you asked me if it's more, uh, it's certainly more efficient than the U.S. because it's organized on the, the simple basis, um, and, I, and I'm a total advocate of this, is that they accept the idea that there's going to be, a, you know, natural hazard events. Now they accept the idea that there's also Nantech events, right, which is the nuclear event. And um, because they accept those ideas, they do something uh, about it. Um, uh, in, in the United States, we're still a little reluctant to, I, I think it's, it's our individualism and um, our, our notion that we can overcome nature that makes us not want to accept the fact that these events will occur, and, and they will. Um, but here they accept there's going to be earthquakes. They, expect, they accept there's going to be tsunamis. Some places are floods, and now they're dealing with the nuclear thing, which is very complex issue because in, in Fukushima, the prefecture where the the plant is, you have a now a, a twenty kilometer no return zone around that plant, and then the question is going to it's going to take them ten years to remove the fuel rods. So you have ten years of removing the fuel rods, right? And then you say, where do I put these things? Okay, right? Then you have this restoration of all the land between the plant and the 20 kilometers, and then how do you restore the soil? And there's actually mediation, remediation going on right now in forest areas, and they're debating how many leaves of which trees to clean up, and uh, it's down to that level where they're actually starting remediation, um, you know, cleaning leaves of trees and cleaning out the bottoms of forest areas and um, to get the radioactive material <coughs> off the ground. In, in, in um, Sendai, in some of the rice fields near the ocean, they're actually taking off a layer of soil, uh, which was contaminated by all the salt water that got on it and um, the oil and gasoline from cars, right? Into the, so they actually, I watched this, take, taking off the topsoil from the rice fields. And then they're they're then they're replacing it with new soil, so the rice fields can be productive next season. Um, that's a lot of that's a lot of work and a lot of expense, right? And additional to, debris in that form. That's that's right. It's a new debris. It's a new debris pile of this soil, which I don't know where they put it, but um, they're doing that, and they want those rice fields to be productive because people, it's um, something everyone eats rice every day. Mostly Japanese eat rice almost three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I eat rice once a day, usually sometimes two, um, but um, so that remediation is is taking um, all these forms. I mean, it's a very impressive. The other thing is that they, they 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 there's a lot of research on what what's remained in place. Um, I went to a, a lecture by a 
physicist and electrical engineer, and he he his research is he's looking at the photovoltaic the PV photovoltaic installations in all these towns. Which ones stood up? Which ones fell down? Um, did they work after this? Uh, which one corroded by seawater, and which ones didn't? And so that they're they're doing a lot of micro research in different different parts of the building systems. Um, they they like uh, photovoltaic. They want to they want to have alternative energy. So they're studying the impact of this event on all the all the installations. He's got literally um, hundreds of, of installations he's looking at, and what works. They can build them better. I mean that's very very um, important kind of work that we don't see very much in the United States. Wow. Well. I I really appreciate your uh, talking to us today. I, I guess I'd like to conclude by just letting you uh, maybe summarize the two or three things that you think are really most important to learn from all this for us. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I don't know the most important things, actually. Um, I'm, I'm going through a period of sort of being depressed about the scope of this whole thing and, and being glad that they're they're so focused on this i i think the first thing you you learn from this um is that if you accept the fact that you're going to have a disaster event occur in your area whatever event it is and whether it's flood or tornado and everything once you accept it you can do something about preparing better so i think i if i was to if i was to have, do anything i would Tell everybody out there, except that this, if, if it's going to happen, do something about it. I, I think um, the work in flooding started to do that. Certainly, the Charlotte Mecklenburg people are understand that they they they, they embrace that that concept, um, uh, and that helps out. Um, the so okay, after you do that, the the other thing is that you we need for areas that do this, really much more detailed um, uh, recovering, recovering, recovery governance um, systems and mechanisms. You know, what, what do you do? I mean, I don't think people realize that if your city hall or your county building gets you know, taken away and all your records, your property records, mm -hmm. you know, get destroyed, right? What are you going to do about that? Um, you know, and so that... Uh, that local government people from all types, and that's not a planning issue. It, it really is a governance issue. It's a continuity of government issue. And um, they should start preparing for that all the way through. Because in the United States, we're a you know, federated system where um, you know, states have different funding mechanisms, cities have different funding mechanisms. How are you going to pay you know, your city workers? I mean, what's the financing going to look like? Um, um, we know enough about the New Orleans um, situation that uh, San Francisco is changing its whole structure of financing and bond issues and credit with the banks in order to have a continuity of revenue going through. Uh, <coughs> San Francisco is very advanced in their their acceptance, and they, they want to actually evacuate in place. They, they want to make all the buildings strong enough that no one has to leave them, any, any of them, and they, so they don't need evacuation centers. That's a very advanced thinking, in my view. Um, the... the um, uh, the, the other is that um, we, we simply um, shouldn't put anything in areas we know are dangerous um, unless we take lots and lots of um, mitigation measures about allowing that. Because if we do that, um, even though the, and I've already been to five lectures on the tsunami prediction models here in Japan, which are incredibly complex and they're actually centers that do nothing but collect data and do these prediction modeling and they do this very very well I mean that relying simply on older historic events um, is, is not the right the right method anymore uh, because this event which they now call a thousand year event that happened in Japan um, did occur a thousand years ago right mm -hmm. um, and um, the modeling isn't sophisticated enough um, to take it to the policymakers to say this thousand-year event. Maybe we should think about these events in in um, in a different way. And and uh, the best sea break, the best um, 
um, breakwater in the world was in one of the bays in one here in the entire world, and that breakwater failed. So if the best breakwater in the world failed in the tsunami, all the rest of the world's breakwaters are going to fail too, in my view. Right? This is the, the top breakwater and it didn't work. Uh, it broke apart and the tsunami came in. So um, you, you really have to, um, uh, in dangerous areas, you really, my, my view is in dangerous areas you take special precautions. That's the other thing I've learned about this. And the third is that um, in, a, in a gigantic event, um, most of the government mechanisms, local, county or state or national, it will likely to be over, overwhelmed for a short period of time. They'll be overwhelmed and won't work properly and people should not um, be angry about this because it's the definition of a catastrophic event. Catastrophic event is where, you know, the system the, 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 will be overwhelmed. Yeah. Overwhelmed. So, in a catastrophic event, that should be an expectation. So, the design should be to put them back in place as fast as you can. Those are my remarks, and I appreciate you having this um, blog up and, and trying to educate the American public. Well, thank you very much. And All right, my uh, pleasure. It's certainly uh, exciting to have an opportunity to interview you from Japan and, and talk about these events. Okay, good luck on all your work. Thank you very much.